right, good morning, church. Yes, opening weekend of NFL football. Niners on at 10. We knew the nine o'clock would be packed, and here you are. Every seat taken, people standing in the back. Gosh, I love this church. Um, no, really, what I'm most excited about is we are in week five. Welcome those worshiping online. So glad to have you. You might be in town, you might be out of town, you might be driving to a soccer game. You might be watching this later. We're so glad you're tuning in. We're in, we're in week five of a series on Romans, which means we're in Romans chapter five. And my question for you to start is, are you ready for some more good news? Okay, here it is. Romans five, beginning at verse one. Here's where we're going today. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice, sorry, go back, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, some of your translations might say, does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The first reference of the Holy Spirit by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's the word of the Lord for today. Let's pray and ask him to add his blessing to the reading of his word. Heavenly Father, what a word. We thank you that it's alive. We pray that it would come alive through preaching. We pray even more so, God, that it would come alive in our hearts. I pray that you would help us to preach through our lives. So move in this time, bring uh, encouragement and conviction and correction where needed. Lord, help us to remember the hope that we have in you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Question, would you agree that we live in an age of information overload? Information overload. I was thinking about all the different ways now that we just get bombarded with information. Research shows that the average person is subject to, we, we, we take in 10,000 ads a day. All different ways, digital media, social media, TV, online, print, phones. The ads on our phones are blowing my mind recently. If you talk about something, if someone talks about something, have you thought lately, like, they're listening, they're listening? Because then you pick up your phone, and as you scroll, the ad for the thing that you just talked about or someone talked to you is up there. And I don't know if you've experienced this. This is a recent phenomenon. Now I think something is really, really wrong and happening. Because sometimes I know that I have not said it, I've just thought about it. And I open up my phone, like how does this happen? Someone who works in this space, educate me, how does this happen? I think about it, I open up and it's there, amen? Say amen if you've experienced that. We live in a, an age of information overload. I thought, is this just a feeling or is this, is this verifiable fact? I did a little research this week, and believe it or not, it's, it's verifiable. Um, the amount of data that existed from the beginning of time to 2003, this is total data ever created, all the encyclopedias, every book ever written, the internet from the, be from the beginning of time up to 2003. Now, I don't know about you, I sent my first email in May of 1996 to a UCLA professor. I'm like, this is sweet. Save me a 30 minute walk across campus. It's amazing. All information from the beginning of time to 2003 totals about five exabytes of data. One exabyte is a billion gigabytes, just for context. Five exabytes of data, beginning of time to 2003. Recent research shows that we now produce five exabytes of data every two days. We live in a world of information overload. So what that means for us, this is why I've been praying for you about this last week, 
So we're going through this book of Romans and it's like, it is like banger after banger, chapter after chapter. And I'm going, Lord, with all the information that's competing for our attention, would you help us? I have prayed for you. Would you help us to, we have to do a couple things. We have to filter out the information that we don't need, that we're taking in uh, in all different ways and forms throughout, or not let it in at all, and, and filter in and hold on to the truths that are really, really important, amen? And I will tell you that what we just read, Romans chapter five, verses one through five, is of utmost importance. We have to hold on to it, and the reason why is it's all about hope. And we all need hope. We all need hope. So hold on to the hope we have. And, and this is hope that we actually have. It's not hope that we have to chase. It's not hope that we have to go get. We have it. We just need to hold on to it. Because at times, we all feel hopeless. There are times. There will be times where we all feel hopeless in our lives. Research shows that if you take a hopeless person in a hopeless situation and introduce just 10% hope, it can transform the whole person and the whole situation. Just 10% hope, just a little bit of hope. I was reminded of this recently. I have not had a lot of hope in my recent trips to airports on trips. I told you about a bad one a few weeks ago. Well, there's another one that happened uh, just before that. So these are my last two big trips. Uh, we go to Minnesota, where my wife is from, every summer for about a week to spend the time with that side of the family. And we bring our boys. In the last few years, we brought uh, my oldest son's best friend. His name is Nolan. He's like a perfect fit. He's friends with all the boys in our family. It's like a perfect fourth son. So the six of us go. And have you ever walked up to an interaction with someone, especially at an airport, so these people are very important, and you just get a bad feeling about someone, like this person's gonna screw this up. You ever had that before? I had this feeling walking up, we're checking at SFO. And I just looked at this guy, he just didn't, just didn't look right, I'm telling you. <laughs> and so we check in and we get our six. So I check in for everybody, here's our six. He gives us these six things and we're walking back toward the gate and I look and I go, I don't see, I see all the Scots, I do not see Nolan Collins, I see Johnny Barnes. We don't have a Johnny Barnes in our party. <laughs> so I go back to this guy, I go, I knew he was gonna mess this up. And, and we had already given him all our luggage, and, and a key part of our luggage is we're going to Minnesota, and, and Bridget's parents, they, my in-laws, they live on a lake in Minnesota, so what our boys love to do is they get up in the morning, and first thing in the morning, they'll go out and they fish for like an hour, and it's incredible. And then the last thing they do every day is they go out on the pontoon boat, and they go to the other side of the lake, and they fish, and it's glorious because they're gone. For the, the morning hours, they're gone at night. It's glorious, I'm telling you. And they go out together and they, and they encourage one another, which is rare, and they take videos when they catch a fish and they help, it's just, it's awesome. But this guy didn't look right. And so we checked all the stuff in, and the big, it's the most important piece of the luggage is the big, all the fishing poles and all the rods and all the reels and all the lure, it's all in there. So we're walking away and I'm going like, uh oh, we don't have a Johnny Barnes, go back, give me Nolan Collins. He said, no problem, quick switch. So we walk off, we check in, and I, we're getting off the plane and we're walking in, I go, I just have that bad feeling. And sure enough, guess what does not show up in Minnesota? All the poles, so I call. And they go, oh, the fishing poles, oh, those, yeah, all that stuff. I go, by the way, we're on a fishing trip. <laughs> and the guy says, well, guess what? They're with a guy named Johnny Barnes <laughs> at JFK. And I go, when can we get those back? And the guy says, you can't. It's going to be at least a week because, and he, he pulls this one, and this is, this is a different sermon, it's a different illustration. He says, well, because of COVID, I go, whoa, no, you don't. We just have to stop with the because of COVID, amen? You just can't stop doing that. And he said, I know it. I said, this is, this is a really big deal for our boys for this week. I was hopeless. And he goes, but here's what I can do. He says, tell you what. Go to a Bass Pro Shop, go to a Cabela's, this is our fault. Replace everything you had. Send me the receipt to Sun Country Airlines. Like, that gave me some hope. <laughs> that gave the boys some hope, they had some fun with that. 
They fished a lot on that trip. We know what it's like to be hopeless though, don't we? Maybe you, you entered into a, like a business deal that went bad. You lost a bunch of money financially. Your retirement dwindled. We've all been in hopeless situations. Maybe you're a married couple going through a bad season, an extended season, negative in your marriage. You feel like you've tried everything, counseling, couples counseling, his counseling, her counseling. Nothing works. You feel hopeless. You're single. You've tried everything. Blind dates, group dates, dating apps. You've tried the rekindle with the high school crush. Nothing seems to be working. Can't find the right person. It feels hopeless. For me, what makes me feel hopeless is feeling overwhelmed with my schedule. People, events, felt a little like that this week. Plus preaching and leading, feeling like I work in the church too much and can't get up above it to work on the church, on the organization. For my wife, what, what, is, what makes her feel hopeless, I promise, I don't even have to ask her because I already know, it's this right here, it's the kitchen sink. I knew this week when I was studying and writing this message, I thought if I go, I'm gonna walk into my kitchen right now and take a picture of the kitchen sink and no matter what, so I just walked in and sure enough, this was it. So I took a picture and this drives, this is my wife, this is her kryptonite. She asks us and I am guilty. This is, I didn't even have to ask her for permission because this one's on me and the boys because she's like, just put the dishes into the dishwasher. Hey, hold on a second. That was not a spot to clap. But she says, just put in. So I said, in our defense, it's not like it's too far sometimes. Like I, to, to get them all the way into, <laughs> to get them all the way to the dish. And I'm just going to, I'm going to show you actually. It's sometimes it's too far because I justify it in my mind. I go, it's, we should have designed it better. It, to get them from the sink, I took a picture to show you how far it is. From the sink into the dishwasher, here's the picture. It is one inch. <laughs> that is the sink. That is the handle to the dishwasher. But I go, sometimes that inch just feels like a mile. It's just too far. This is... Tell you, it makes my, it breaks Bridget, she just feels hopeless. No, in all seriousness. Some of us, it's much more serious than that. Depression, anxiety makes us feel hopeless. We have a teenager, or you, you are a teenager, and a situation with your friends, a class, a subject that you just, it cannot click for you, makes you feel hopeless. Maybe you lost someone that you loved that makes us feel hopeless. Maybe just the last several years of living, you just lost some hope in, in the world, in our country, in our state, in our leaders, maybe even in God. So the question is, how can we not lose hope? How do we hold on to the hope that we have in Christ, cling to it? This, this five verses from Romans chapter five at verse one. I'm gonna give you three reasons you always have hope based on this short little passage. Here's reason number one, if you're a note taker, or you wanna take pictures or whatever. Reason number one, you always have hope. You have peace with God. You have peace with God. Look what Paul says in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Straight from Scripture. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we rejoice. Here's the word. It appears in each part of this passage. All three parts. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let's break this down. Let's start with this one. Therefore. The word therefore. Quietly. little fun fact on Romans. The book of Romans, which is like the most incredible treatise ever, is built, the foundation, the four corners of the foundation are built on four therefores. Therefore, number one, chapter three at verse 20, Paul says, therefore, no one is declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. You can't work for it. Right here is the second 
therefore, chapter five at verse one. The third one, another big pivot in the book, chapter eight at verse one. We'll get there in a few weeks. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The fourth one, the four corners of the foundation of the book of Romans, chapter 12 at verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves, your lives, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. You master the four therefores, you master the message of Romans. Next phrase, since you've been justified through faith. Now, Pastor Ryan and Pastor Caleb, the week before that, gave great messages about being justified through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Amen? Did they not do a great job over the last two weeks? Um, now, that's a place to clap, by the way, if you're just following along with that. You just out of practice, you clapped at the wrong thing. The sink was not the time. But that is when this is the time. We've been, justified means made right with God. Some of the translations say, you've been made right in God's sight through Jesus Christ. It's, listen church, it's better than forgiveness. It's, it's when God looks at you based on your faith in Christ, he sees you, listen to this, as if you never sinned. That's justified, it's a legal term, justified through faith. Because of that we have, here it is, peace with God. This is confidence, this is security. But listen to this, it is not a feeling. It's not a feeling of like subjective serenity. Paul is saying don't base your faith on your feelings. Your feelings, he says this in other part, your feelings will lie to you. Our feelings will lead us astray. Paul goes, no, this is objective reality. You have, it's not just you feel at peace with God. He's saying you have peace with God. It's way better. Now, lots of people, sometimes in the church and especially outside of the church, think the primary point of faith is to feel therapeutic feelings of peace. Like, that's the point. People say, hey, I'm glad that Christianity, your faith, makes you feel good or feel peace. I feel that from yoga. I feel that from meditation. I feel that from long walks. I feel that from eating kale. I feel that from drinking bourbon. I feel that from a beach vacation. I feel that from another trip to Tahoe. I feel that from rubbing essential oils on my lymph nodes. <laughs> Paul says it's way better than any of that. You have actual peace with God, greater than feelings. What you actually have, and just to use Ryan's phrasing from last week, you have this by grace, through faith, in Jesus. You have peace with God and you know it. Just to show you a quick difference of a great preacher, Scottish preacher, Alastair Begg, about the difference between feelings and knowing. Take a look at this. Eventually the band did what it did and then the, the person who was to lead the, the praise his opening gambit was this. Hey, how do you all feel this morning? Well, that was enough for me. I was ready. I, we could have had the benediction right there. That was so good. <laughs> I thought, what kind of New Testament question is that? How do you all feel this morning? If I told you how I feel, especially in light of the last five minutes, you would question my, whether I was even a Christian at all. So don't ask me that question. Ask me what I know. Ask me what I know. Don't ask me what I feel about myself. Ask me what I know about God. Ask me what I know about his word. Ask me what I know to be a verity that can deal with my soul. That's what I need. Don't make me sing songs about how I feel. Don't. The silly, repetitive songs again and again. I just want to praise you. Lift my hands and say I love you. You are everything to me. Goodness, at half past eight on a Sunday morning, I'm barely ambulatory. I can't start there. <laughs> and you want me to say that? I just kicked the dog, and I don't even have a dog. I, would, I, could, I could argue with someone because they took my parking space. I never had spilled my coffee. I didn't read my Bible. I'm a miserable wretch. And now you want me to start here. How do you feel? I feel rotten. That's how I feel. What do you got for me? The answer, nothing. 
I got nothing for you. That's why you have to get yourself under the control of the Scriptures. That's why it is what we know, the verities of the Scriptures, which then fuel our hearts and our emotions and lead us on. Let's go! I mean, gosh. And because of what we know, we have this humble confidence like, like, we're in, but not because of what we've done, because of what Jesus has done for us. Like Caleb talked about two weeks ago when he, he got to play Pebble Beach, had nothing to do with it. His friend had an extra spot. He was in because of someone he knew. Someone brought him in. It was a gift. You know what that's like. Maybe not to play Pebble Beach. You know what it's like to be at a dinner or an event or have an experience or have access to something where you're only in because of someone you know. Alastair Begg was reminding us, we know. The scriptures tell us we know we have peace with God. Three reasons you always have hope. Number one, you have peace with God. We know this better than feelings. Reason number two, your pain has a purpose. Someone needs to hear this this morning. I know it. I've prayed for you this week. You're going through it. And you need to be reminded through the scriptures what we know that your pain has a purpose. Look what Paul says in the next two verses. Not only so, I love that. So he he gives point number one in the first two verses. And this phrase right here, not only so, that's a little euphemism, a Turner phrase that says, this was great. What I'm about to say next might even be better. Not only so, But we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because, there it is again, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character, here's what we have, produces hope. Question. How can we grow in perseverance if we don't have anything to persevere through, we actually need suffering. I heard a recent conversation with parents who were, and just, I prayed about whether or not to use this one because parents and kids, is, these are dicey, so I'm, I'm on hallowed ground here. They're talking about their kids and pulling their kids out of standardized testing. You know, like star testing, you know, grade school, three or four days of tests. Uh, and I realized there's strong feelings among parents about their kids in tests. I, I went to back to school night two, night two weeks ago, and my biggest observation besides that I you know, love San Ramon and the teachers are great, is they don't, and I was thinking this is probably why, they don't even call them tests anymore. Call them assessments. Call them assessments. But they're tests, and uh, these parents are pulling their kids out of standardized tests And it wasn't that they were doing it, it was the reason why that kind of struck me a little bit. And the reason why was because their kids were feeling nervous and anxious and a little bit stressed about the tests. So the parents don't want their kids feeling nervous, they don't want them to feel angst, they don't want them to feel stress, so they were excusing them from the three to four days of school where they were taking the test. Now I acknowledge, I'm gonna say this, this should cover it, I acknowledge that parents know best, you know what's best for your kids, But, (laughs) but, I believe that this passage is teaching us that when we bail our kids out or where we bail ourselves out of every situation that might bring stress or angst or nerves, we are not doing them, we are not doing ourselves any favors. In fact, we may be doing ourselves a huge disservice. When we don't do hard things or go through hard things, Paul says, how can we practice perseverance? How do we learn to endure, to suffer, to suffer well, to get ourselves into a situation where that process of sanctification can take place, where suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. What I've learned is, is 
if these things in my life bring me stress or nerves or angst, and I stop doing these things, here's what I've noticed. I've noticed that I don't get stressed out about less things, I get stressed out about lower things. Does that make sense? So things that used to make me, things that shouldn't make me stressed or that used to not make me stressed now make me nervous because I don't do hard things. I'll give you a personal example from my life. I started in ministry as a pastor, I mean, my 26th year. So when I was 23 years old, as part of a group of about 30 volunteers, we got together because we wanted to start a young adult ministry. This is at Three Crosses Church. We wanted to start a young adult ministry, and I was a young adult. And so it was like a peer group. We had about 30 people got together. We prayed over several weeks. We divvied up roles, and we were going to launch this thing on Tuesday nights to young adults 22 to 35 years old because we thought there was a need, and we'd be meeting a need. So we had some worship. We were going to have some teaching. And they said to me, why don't you bring the message week one? So I said, okay, I could try that. I'll study for that. So I remember studying, and we, there we are, we on the launch night, this group was called Network, and it was in the middle of the songs, and I knew I was getting up to preach next, and I felt really nervous, I actually felt sick to my stomach. And so I got up and I went into the back of the room and into the kitchen that was off the room where we were meeting, and I thought, it's not just nerves, I actually have to do something. And so I walked over to a little graphic here, I walked over to the garbage can and I puked in a garbage can, because I was so nervous. And then they were wrapping up, and I'm going, okay, this is bad timing, but all like, Bleh you know, stressed out and verklempt, I walk up there to preach my first sermon. Didn't feel that great. But I thought, you know what? I got that one under my belt. And so the next week, they go, hey, great job preaching. Why don't you do that every week? And I'm like, okay. It's a little additive to my day job, but that's fine. Um, I showed up the next week. I thought I have that one in behind me. Nope, same thing. The first like five or six times at least, it was a half dozen time, I was physically so stressed out that I was like at the garbage can in the kitchen before I preached. And I wanna be clear about this. It wasn't just because of like nerves of getting up in front of people. That has always been something since I was a little kid that I was pretty comfortable with. It was the, the nervousness, the angst about doing right by teaching God's word. I'm like, who am I? But here's my point. If I would have tapped out anywhere in those first few weeks, I was thinking about this this week, it actually made me emotional. Think of the blessed, think of the calling, the purpose, the thing that God made me to do that would bring the most fruit in my life and even through my life, I would have missed it. I was thinking of another just practical example. We honored Don and Joan Kurtz earlier. You know, Don, 92 years old, 69 years of marriage. By the way, they're my across, right across the street neighbors. Here's a picture I took with them yesterday, right here. <laughs> Love the Kurtzes. Love them. What a, what a blessing of the Lord to move in across the street from them 16 years ago. Don, you don't know this about Don. One of my favorite things about Don is Every single week when I come in after preaching, I've preached hundreds of sermons in my 12 years here at CPC, and every other preacher who has ever preached there, when you walk in on Monday morning, there is a voicemail message of encouragement for the preacher about what he loved, appreciated, and learned, gleaned from the preaching of God's word the day before. And I mean every single week, a hope-filled Message of encouragement in front of everybody. Thank you, brother. Now, I, so I go, how does someone have that much hope? And then I started to think in light of this message, 92 years old, the man has suffered through his life. He's been through some things. 69 years of marriage, he has suffered Not because of you, Joan, just marriage is hard. I mean, all the married people are laughing the hardest right now. We know. 51 years as a member of CPC, there's been a lot of changes. It's probably not the exact same church that he remembers when they started and what he would have chosen. 
Think about that. Iterations of your military service, he has suffered. Kids in the military, separation, he has suffered. Eight moves for Chevron over the course of their marriage, they've suffered. And suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Same is true for you, same is true for me. Oftentimes when we say, I don't wanna go through that. I don't wanna suffer. I don't wanna endure that trial. We're short-circuiting what God wants to do in us. And what I've noticed is God often wants to do something in you before he does something for you or through you. I'm gonna say that again. God often wants to do something in you before he does something for you or through you. Your pain has a purpose, is to give hope. Let's put the scriptures back up there. It says, not only so, we also rejoice in our suffering because we know, there's, we know that suffering produces perseverance. You know what perseverance is? In the Greek, it literally means the ability to keep going. The ability to press on. Suffering produces the ability to keep going. The ability to keep going produces character. The word there for the Greek is, means a character, a Christ-like character that's been refined as if in a furnace. So you grow in your ability to keep going. You grow in your Christ-like character as the, the impurities and the imperfections and the dross is burned off through the trial. And character produces hope. And there we are. Back to hope. Um... One of my goals as a pastor, and I think one of my responsibilities, if I'm teaching up here the majority of the time, which I am, is I've got to teach a healthy theology of suffering. Because it's all over the scriptures. And my calling is to teach the scriptures. So we can't be a, a prosperity gospel church where it says, hey, you follow Jesus, you're gonna make more money, it's gonna be all blessing, all up and to the right, it says the opposite in scripture. And I'm here to tell you the truth. It, and every major person in scripture says it. Jesus says it. So we'll start with him. Good place to start. John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to suffer. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Peter says it. First Peter chapter 4, at verse 12 and following. He goes, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that come upon you like giant waves. And listen to this to test you. So when we start to suffer, so many of us, myself included, I'm preaching to myself right here, we go, why is this happening? And Peter goes, why are you acting surprised? James, the half-brother of Jesus, count it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of any kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, the ability to keep going, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So listen, church. This is to every one of us because we're all going to suffer. How we respond to suffering is going to it's going to be a it's going to greatly shape who we are and who we become as Christ followers and shape our testimony to other people around us, family members, friends, colleagues. We don't always we've said this before in other series, we don't always get to choose what happens to us. We always get to choose how we respond. 100% of the time, how we respond. Sometimes you follow Jesus and your spouse leaves you. And you suffer. Sometimes we follow Jesus and a loved one gets cancer. And sometimes they get healed, and sometimes they don't. And you suffer. Sometimes you follow Jesus, and a relationship falls apart, and you suffer. And sometimes we follow Jesus, and a son, or a daughter, or a grandson, or a granddaughter, they, they don't make all the right moves. And sometimes we don't make all the right moves. And we suffer. We will suffer, we will experience pain, but we can, I mean, it's the words of Paul, because we know 
that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance produces Christ-like character. And character produces hope. Came across a couple quotes that are just, they're so good, I gotta share them with you. First one by D.A. Carson, he says, I'm not suffering from anything that a good resurrection can't fix. <laughs> just puts things into perspective. And the next one by Corey Ten Boom, she's a Nazi concentration camp survivor. She says, I never really knew that God was all I needed until he was literally all I had. Second reason. We can always have hope, according to this passage, is we know that our pain has a purpose. Here's the third reason. We'll wrap up with this. You are never alone. No matter what you're going through, you are never alone. Paul wants to make us aware of this. You are never alone. And not only just not alone, look who is with you. Look at the next verse, verse five. And hope, there it is again, does not put us to shame. It doesn't disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through none other than the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. First reference to the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans, who has been given to us. You have the Holy Spirit. 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 I have the Holy Spirit. I'm never alone. I'm never alone no matter what we're going through. Now, I don't have the time, at least today, but I'll probably, the, the, the Holy Spirit actually reminded me you probably owe me, this is what the Holy Spirit said to me this week, you probably owe me a whole message on me. <laughs> so we only have five minutes at the end of this message. But in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit has a, a, a common word in the Greek that it's referred to as, I'll show you here, it's paraclete. I just wanna give you the three most common definitions or examples of how the Holy Spirit as a paraclete functions, and it's as a counselor, as a helper, and as a comforter. And just give you a few examples. I thought, I was praying like I often do. Okay, Lord, give me a story. That, and the Holy Spirit goes, you don't need any stories on this one. Just point them to the scriptures. So the first one from John chapter 14, how the Holy Spirit functions as our counselor. He says, but the counselor... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, Jesus says, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're going, I, I just, what I need is I need, to, I need to learn wisdom. I need understanding about something specifically going on in my life. I need to know what to do. I need to know how to act. I need to know how to, to, I need to be taught how to live. I need to be taught so that I can grow. I need to be taught, counseled, so that I could grow in wisdom. Well, that's the first way the Holy Spirit works, as a counselor, as a teacher. Here's another way, as a comforter. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort. Why does God comfort us? Not just for us, but so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. There are people here, I promise you, and you're, you're in a season of grief. It, you, you just... You don't need any conviction from God right now. You just need comfort. And what this tells us, the God of all comfort is the one who through the Holy Spirit, the comforter, brings us comfort. And not only does he comfort us in our troubles when we really need him the most, he comforts us in a way so that we can then eventually turn around. The comfort is so genuine, it's so sincere, it's so life transforming that eventually we can use that comfort and share with other people when they're going through it as our pain becomes our platform, as our misery becomes our ministry. Some of you are already in that place. We comfort others like God himself through the Holy Spirit has comforted us. Last example, just quickly, gosh, this one is, this is, this is mind-blowing, this is amazing. 
Romans 8, I'm stealing a little bit, but I, I might have to come back and cover it when we get to Romans 8 in a few weeks. It says, likewise, the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit of God, also helps us in our weaknesses for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. The Holy Spirit, this is how he helps us. We don't, we're just feeling weak. We're feeling overwhelmed. We're feeling tired. We're feeling distant. We're feeling discouraged. Whatever it is that makes you feel weak, that's when the Holy Spirit, the helper, kicks in, and the Spirit himself makes intercession. That's praise for us with groanings which cannot even be uttered. We can't even understand them. Next verse, verse 27. Likewise, I'm sorry, now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Let me just break this down and then I'm gonna explain it for just a second. He who searches hearts, all throughout Scripture, start in the Old Testament, there's only one person who searches hearts, there's only one person who knows hearts, and it's God the Father. So when we feel weak, we have the Holy Spirit on our behalf. So go, I got you right now. I'm interceding to the Father on your behalf. And the Father, the one who searches hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because it's another person of the Godhead because he, the Spirit, makes intercession for the saints. That's us according to the will of God. I mean, do you, oh gosh, Lord, please help this click into people's hearts and give them hope do you know what this means, church? That means when you feel weak, when you feel so overwhelmed, you don't even know what to pray. You don't even know what to pray. You don't even know what you ought to pray for. It's this promise right here is that the Holy Spirit of God helps you so much. He goes, I got this. I'm ever interceding for you with words you don't even understand to God the Father. And God the Father, the one who searches the hearts, he knows the mind of me, the Holy Spirit, because he's also God. And so he is adapting your prayers, okay, according to his will for you. This is what's happening. And Jesus, the other member of the Godhead, all he did was justify you so that you could stand before God faultless before the throne like we sang earlier today. You got all three members of the Godhead working on your behalf constantly. If that doesn't give you hope, I don't even know what does. I just don't even know what to say. Three reasons we all have hope, church. Summary slide, take a picture so you don't forget this message. Number one, you have peace with God, better than a feeling. Number two, your pain has a purpose. And the purpose is simple. That suffering is producing perseverance, which is producing character, and character more, hope. And number three, you're never alone. You have the Holy Spirit of God with you. So you just heard truth from scripture. And truth, church, demands a response, amen? So let's stand and respond. I'm just gonna ask you to lead you through a little prayer here. First thing I do, just to, to receive what God has for you, just close your eyes, bow your head, and just hold your hands out as if we're saying, Lord, whatever you have for us right now, we receive it from you. Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we just say we love you, we thank you, we thank you for your word and the hope that comes from this incredible passage here this morning. God, I pray for every person here watching at home. We stand before you, arms up, arms open, hands open, ready to receive what you have for us Maybe, maybe we don't feel, maybe we don't know that we have peace with you. Maybe we're struggling in our lives to still earn it. We don't know that we stand in grace, that we've truly been justified, made right. It happened because of what you did, Jesus for that person who doesn't know that they have hope, would you impress upon that brother, that sister, that son, that daughter? They have hope. They have it. They don't have to chase it. They don't have to find it. They have it. Help them to hold on to that hope. For the brother or sister who is in the midst of a season of pain, of suffering, of grief, and they come, 
for all of us. Would you remind them, God, that their pain has a purpose? And it's a beautiful purpose. It's to produce perseverance, the ability to keep going, to press on, and character, like refined by fire, to become more like Christ, and character that, that produces hope. And we all need hope. Maybe someone needs the reminder that gives them hope that their pain has a God-given purpose in their life today. And God, for the brother or sister who just feels alone now or often, remind them, out of your love, you poured out the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And that word for pour is like, it's a current, like a river. Like we can feel it when we're standing in a rushing river. Thank you, God, for the gift of your Holy Spirit that reminds us that we're never alone. If anybody's feeling alone right now, remind them and press upon their hearts, you are with us. And you bring comfort. And you bring counsel. And you bring help. Like when we feel weak, you're interceding to the Father on our behalf. And the Father who knows and searches our hearts and also knows the mind of the Holy Spirit is translating the prayers on our behalf according to the will of the Father for us. It's incredible. We're so far from alone. <laughs> So Father, thank you for your word. Encourage us, sharpen us, convict us where you need to. We receive your word. Help us to hold on to the hope we have in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next week.